Could you please confirm if my screen is visible? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. So good evening, everyone. And uh, today we have, uh, we are going to uh, have a session on DevOps. It's an introductory session. So before we start with the session, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Puneet Kumar Bhatia and I'm having around two decades of IT experience. I worked upon uh, prestigious uh, corporations and with the various clients across the globe on the various technologies. And since last seven to eight years, I'm associated with the DevOps and its relevant technologies. And I'm having around 10 years of experience in uh, training uh, on uh, the relative technologies. And uh, the last uh, five to six years, I've been uh, covered most of the latest technologies in DevOps, including Docker, Kubernetes, Ansible, Chef, Puppet. So these are the tools which I have covered. And uh, that, that's about my uh, introduction. So with that, um, let's start with the topic, the DevOps tools. So we have uh, divided the section into the four parts, starting with the basics of the DevOps, and then what are the various stages of the DevOps? Then what are the various tools available in the DevOps? And at the end, we have uh, 10 minutes of Q&A session so that we can handle your queries for any kind of uh, doubts or any queries about the course or about your uh, skill set, right? So if you have uh, in your mind, like, am I eligible for this course? Or if you are not from the IT background, how can I do that course, right? So, so we'll be covering all your uh, queries at the end of the session. So let's start with the basics one. So before I start, I just wanted to have a quick uh, uh, check, like how many of you are from uh, the IT background or knows basics about DevOps so that I can cover my contents accordingly based upon your background. So if you can just briefly uh, even type in a chat window, just unmute yourself and say like, how many of you are from the IT background and how much knowledge you're having in DevOps that will give me a fair picture about your background and I'll be covering the, the topics accordingly. Could you either type in a chat window, like <clears throat> how much you are familiar with the DevOps or you are new to DevOps or you, are, you know basics and wanted to do advanced level. So just type in the chat window so that I can come to know about your uh, skill sets. So Kiran said, I have experience with Git and GitLab. Okay, uh, DevOps, I don't know the name, but the name reflected here is DevOps. Okay, new to DevOps, good. <clears throat> what about others? Can you quickly type in the chat window? Kiran with 15 years of experience in IT, just starting DevOps, good. Okay, so anyone else want to share uh, about your experience? Uh, if you are from the IT background, experience in IT, but due to DevOps. So as per the comments, what I could sense that most of you are having basic knowledge of uh, <clears throat> IT and other tools and technologies, but new to the DevOps, right? Good, thank you. So let's uh, st start with the topic, uh, what is DevOps? So you might have heard this term in the recent uh, few years, and it's a hot buzzword around uh, the market, the IT industry, the DevOps, right? So this is this technology is not very old. So if you can say it's around, a, a decade old technology, uh, DevOps, that's around 2009 or 10, it was uh, invented. So there was a person, Patrick Davios, who actually known as the father of the DevOps. So let's understand like how uh, was the word, how was IT industry before the DevOps comes into the market? So before, if we talk about uh, the early days before the DevOps, so we have heard about the various teams, like we had different development teams, 
we have uh, a different uh, quality or testing team, a separate team for operations or software engineering or IT team, right? So all these teams were working in silos. There were hardly any communication between these uh, teams, right? And uh, that that's that's the big wall of confusion between these teams, right? So these this gap between these teams is known as the, the wall of confusion, right? So that is where that, that person, Patrick Davis, has sensed that wall of confusion between these teams and he came up with a solution that why not we come up with a single team which is which consists of the blend of technologies where we have developers, where we have testers, a few of them are from database background, right? DB administrators. And then also we have some couple of <clears throat> people from the agile background right so scrum masters a release manager so this is the team which we can say a core to all the phases of the software development and this is one of the central team from which each and every project goes through right so each team communicate with the devops team every project or every product passes through the devops team and that is you can say the core of the software development or IT industry, right? So IT, for, for any organization, if you have the DevOps team, that's one of the central team, which is communicating to all the stakeholders in the company, right? So this is how we used to do the development earlier, where all these teams were working in silos. If a developer was working on his machine, the code was working fine on his machine, but when it goes to production, there was complete mismatch and that code was not working in the production. So that confusion was there, right? So that uniformity of platform was not there. That end-to-end -end, uh, uniform platform uh, was missing, right? The infrastructure uh, baseline was not there. So there were a few uh, disadvantages which have been resolved when the DevOps uh, came into the market. Now, what is DevOps, right? So DevOps is, uh, as I told, it, it's a combination of two terms, developments plus operations, right? So when we combine the development part of the uh, product uh, with the operation part, it comes up with a single term that is DevOps. So it's it's a methodology, or we can say it, it's, a, it's a concept where <clears throat> it consists of set of principles and the guidelines, right, which helps to develop uh, the products as well as to uh, handle the release management of that part. That means launching the product to the end users. So that's this team consists of uh, two kind of people who are developing the products as well as handling the operation part that helps to hand it over to the end users, right? So if you look at this diagram, the left-hand side, there's a person uh, from the development background, say David is from the developer uh, development background and the right hand side there's a person say peter who's from the operation bag operation team right so when they were working in silos uh, there was a wall of confusion in between between both of them right but when they were part of the devops team they were working together right so because the role and responsibilities of a development team is completely different from an operation team the role of the development team is to develop the code and whenever you are developing the code there are fair chances that you break the code and uh, you will bring your application down on the other hand side uh, the role of the operation team to serve their customers right to to get the application up and running they don't want any kind of downtime so they are exactly against uh, the, the role and responsibilities with each other each and every team is having so that was the confusion between them because they were not able to understand their uh, the others each other's responsibilities. But when they started working together uh, in a collaborative manner, they could understand the sense of um, uh, urgency and the sense of uh, responsibility between these two teams. And then they could understand like it's not uh, they are not working in silos, but they are working as a collaborative and integrated manner. The role and responsibilities of development team and the operation team are not different, but that is the role and responsibility of the DevOps team as a whole. So that is how this DevOps team could able to resolve the issues between these two teams. And the concept worked very well. Uh, and then Apple was the first company who started uh, 
this DevOps team in their company, right? So that was the first company who implemented DevOps in their company. And then uh, gradually it was expand to the other areas and other companies, then gradually it's moved to like uh, other uh, companies, big short companies like Google. And then uh, we have it uh, in uh, <clears throat> say e-commerce companies, say uh, Flipkart, Snapdeal. And uh, along with that, uh, the other companies like social media networking companies, LinkedIn, Facebook. So all these companies, the big short companies, they have a full-fledged DevOps team in their uh, organization. And now, uh, now, if you look at the IT industry, around 70% of companies are having DevOps in their DevOps teams in their company, right? So DevOps is such a uh, essential part now uh, for a software company that around 70% companies have already implemented it or all, all the process of implementing DevOps in their company. And that, that's how fastly grown, uh, grown technology across the world. So one of the latest technology, which we can say it's, it's without it, it's difficult to survive for any IT company to be a market leader. <clears throat> okay. So uh, guys, I will be taking your question and answer at the end. So please uh, park your questions and note it down so that uh, I can take it at the end of the session, right? So coming to the second part, that is DevOps stages. So if you look at this diagram, this is uh, end to end, uh, solution of the DevOps. So we can say the DevOps uh, continuous delivery cycle, right? So the whole cycle, it starts from the business requirements or the business needs till the delivery of the product. So this whole cycle uh, is, uh, as you can see on your screen. So the first thing is uh, we capture the business requirements and the business needs. And that's the role of a product owner, right? So this is one of the member of the uh, agile uh, methodology, right? It's a product owner who actually uh, get the requirements from the business and convert it into the IT, uh, you can say more into the techni technical form. And then it is being handed over to the development team. So development team will work on that uh, after getting the design ready, we we'll start working on the coding part. And uh, while doing the coding and uh, writing the um, scripts or the codes, they are using certain tools like e Eclipse or Visual Studio, right? So based on their uh, product, uh, they can uh, choose which uh, uh, editor they are comfortable with. Say if they are working on a Windows platform, they, they use either Visual Studio or Eclipse, right? For .NET applications, right? Or even for Java applications. So they start developing the code and uh, while developing the code, they are not supposed to work on their uh, separate or individual standalone uh, devices, right? So they are not supposed to work on their personal computers, but that should be someone uh, something a standard platform, right? A uniform platform. Maybe either they are working on their uh, virtual machines, right? Or they are working on their cloud machines, which is uniform across the project, right? Or the product. So each and every individual who's working to develop that product, they are working on a similar kind of configuration. They are not supposed to work on any other device. That's the first requirement. That's, that's where that uniformity of the product lies, right? So we have a uniform platform for that and where we have a lot of tools available in the market that helps to set up our uniform platform. And that is known as infrastructure as a code. You might have heard about Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Terraform. These tools helps to set up your infrastructure, right? And if you are working on your local infrastructure, these, uh, these softwares helps you to configure your local infrastructure as well as cloud. So even if you are working on your cloud platform and you're configuring your cloud machines, these tools helps you to configure in a uniform way and in an automated way. Okay, so that's how the development is being done. It's not being done on your private or personal machines. So once they write the code, they will pass it on to the, they will check into a version control tool, that is Git. Git or SVN subversion, there are different version control tools. The role of the version control tool is to keep track of your uh, changes in the source code, right? So whatever the changes you are making in your product or your application, that's been keep track uh, by the Git or any version control tool. Okay, so that's where, that's why we use the version control tool. So we, we can 
check the history of your changes. You can, if you want to revert back to some previous version, you, you can easily do that. Without a virtual control tool, it is difficult to monitor the or to check the changes to your code. That's where that version control tools comes into the picture. After you check in your code to the version control tool, it is integrated to the continuous integration tool that is Jenkins. So there are a different integration, uh, continuous integration tools like Jenkins, Bamboo, Team City, right? Uh, TFS. So one of the famous uh, or most widely used tool is the Jenkins. So as soon as you check in your code to your Git repository, the Jenkins is integrated to that and it will sense the, that, that some changes have been made to Git repository and it will start triggering your building your code. That's why it is known as continuous integration. That means it's continuously keep checking your repository, source code repository, if it is there is any change in the code. If yes, it will start building your code. And so that without wasting any time or without delaying it, it can produce the results back to the user. So it will tell the user whether the changes that user have been made, they are successful or they are failed. If that is failed, it will send back the mail to the user that the change which you have recently made, that is wrong. So please fix it. So the user will immediately get the notification that the changes I made is are wrong. This, this is the error. So I need to fix it. So immediately that user will work on that uh, error code and fix it and push back to the Git repository. So this cycle continues until the code is successfully built by the Jenkins. So here the manual intervention is not required. Everything is automated. That's why it is known as continuous integration, right? So till this point, this everything which we have discussed that comes under the continuous integration. After this point, what will be discovered, discussing that comes under the continuous delivery or continuous deployment. What is difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment? That uh, we'll be covering in detail later in the, our uh, due course when we'll be actually working on these tools, right? So let's consider it only a continuous delivery. So now when we say continuous delivery, that means it's mainly concerned with deployment, deployment of your code, right? We have already built our source code and till this point, Jenkins has built your code and done the required testing. After it's been tested through automated test scripts, it's been deployed to the deployment uh, servers, right? So their chef, puppet, and Siebel, they are to, to do the deployments. So these are the tools which are known as software configuration management tools. They are also helpful to configure your infrastructure, and they are also helpful in deploying your source code to your deployment repository, right? So after you deploy your code, uh, it will go to the monitoring tools like to monitor the do the health check of your applications. So there are certain tools available like Splunk or there is ELK stack that is for logging purpose. Then we have another tools like Magios, right? And Zabbix. So a couple of monitoring tools are available. So each and every category have three or four set of tools. So we'll be picking up the best one out of each category and we'll be covering in our new course, right? So that's the complete cycle. And uh, I hope you have got some fair idea about the complete DevOps uh, and continuous delivery cycle. Right? Okay, uh, let's go to the next uh, topic that is uh, top 10 DevOps tools. So we'll be discussing at the very high level what are the major tools for DevOps? And we'll be covering, uh, just touching one by one on these tools, not going deep inside these tools as of now, but to give you the more overview about these tools. The first one is Git, which we have just uh, discussed in the previous slide. That is uh, one of the version control tools. So version control tool, by, uh, what does it mean? That it's keep track your changes, right? Uh, if you are putting your source code this key, to this Git repository, they will keep track all the changes of your source code. You can also uh, put them a particular label to your changes. You can, uh, that is known as snapshot, or you can also tag them with you know, some other 
specific tag and they can be used to extract that uh, tag whenever required or they can be restored to the previous uh, position or location if you want right so that is known as rollback if some some error occurs right so for example you have made some changes to your code and tomorrow you say that after building it there was some error so instead of fixing it immediately first of all you will roll back to the previous working condition so that will revert your changes to the previous working condition so that your application is running at least so once you revert to the previous version you will fix whatever you have done in the latest version so that's where this version control tool is very helpful and then this git is distributed in nature uh, other tools are there like svn that is subversion that is a centralized tool so uh, there is a difference between distributed and centralized tools the centralized is having a dependency on their central server this one server and the other clients are there so in case of centralized machine there are certain disadvantages that if the server is down you cannot access your code but in case of distributed it's not the case you can have your code distributed among different machines and it's not dependent upon the central machine and that's it. that's why it is known as distributed and it works on the peer to peer connection that means it pull the whole source code from one repository to another for example there is one server i pull the code from the git repository now i pull the whole code from the git repository and if somebody else wanted to get the code from my machine i can act as a source for him or her so that means that person is not dependent upon the central repository that he or she can pull the code from my repository as well and similarly he can be a server for the third person so that's why how, how it works that is known as peer to peer connection so that's very useful uh, in the case of distributed model so also the performance wise git is much better than uh, any other tool so there are certain other advantages of git one is it is open source it is very lightweight it's very fast to operate right so a lot of features are there the detail details about this will be covering in the actual course but this is the overview about git right so that's about the version control tool there are other very old version control tools are there in the market like when this version control concept initially started around 20 25 to 30 years back so then we have C, css cvs and the vss tools right so central version control tool and then vss so these were very basic tools with very limited functionality but these days the tools have a very uh, they are very rich in features like they have the concept of merging branching right uh, so you can merge between multiple branches you can create new branches right and you can uh, um, have a lot of other features which are there in the version control tools not only just to store your code so that's about the git version control tool next comes the continuous integration tool jenkins right mm -hmm. so this is uh, the this also a very open source tool you can get it free of cost or uh, without paying anything you can download it and start working on that this is built in java so this is that's why it require java to be installed on your machine so you need to install java or jdk to your machine to get jenkins up and running right so this very simple tool this is a ui based tool so you launch the ui uh, or graphical user interface it have lot of plugins available so jenkins is uh, very rich in features and uh, everything in jenkins works in the form of plugins there are thousands of plugins available in jenkins for every activity at the back end that plugin works for example you want to send mail to someone through jenkins you need to install email plugin if you want to publish your report so html publisher plugin will be used if you want to work with docker you will install docker plugin if you want to work in ansible you need to install ansible plugin so it's integrable integratable to any other tool you name the tool and the plugin is available right so not even that it's very compatible with cloud as well and as well as kubernetes right so this is very rich in feature this is the uh, revised version of hudson 
if you have heard about this hudson was the older version of jenkins that was also an open source tool but there was no particular community who was supporting hudson and no ownership was taken by anyone and the the, the plugins were also not very updated then oracle what oracle did the oracle took the hudson and uh, taken the property of the hudson and converted it to jenkins so jenkins is a property tool of oracle corporation right so jenkins comes in two flavors one is open source and another is licensed version so if you are working on specific plugins and specific requirement you can go for the licensed or enterprise version but usually like when we are doing this testing and uh, this learning purpose we can use the open source version and it's being used by a uh, very big short companies like as you can see ebay dell cloudera lt linkedin so most of the companies are using jenkins as a continuous integration tool so this about uh, the very basic background about of jenkins that detailed course will be covering in the actual uh, course so the, you, here you can see that jenkins is being used in almost every phase of the application development in the building so if you wanted to build something through jenkins you can use the plugin like maven so maven plugin will be used to build your source code in java if you want to integrate with the version control tool you have a git plugin for that if you want to do continuous monitoring you have an agios plugin for that if you want to do the deployment you have ansible plugin for that or if you want to work with the puppet you have the puppet uh, plugin for that if you want to do some testing you have selenium plugin or you have j unit plugin right so everything in jenkins works in the form of plugins next comes the selenium it's it's a automation testing tool basically for testing your web applications right so for uh, all kind of web application testing this is one of the most widely used tool and uh, it's uh, the architecture is web based web driver architecture this is the latest uh, uh, technology or you can say feature of the web driver which is being used in selenium okay so that is one of the testing tool uh, there are a lot of other testing tools available like cucumber is there and if you are doing static analysis code analysis then sonar cube is there if you are uh, doing j unit testing then j unit plugins you will install and you will do the j unit testing for java so a lot of testing uh, plugins are available which jenkins uses to do all kind of testing for your code right so next is docker this is one of the very important uh, component of uh, devops so docker is one of the latest technologies right so that is a known as containerization concept of containerization so when we talk about containerization we first need to know about virtualization so virtualization means when you are having multiple machines installed on your host machine so for example you are working on a windows operating system on your laptop right so you have only one operating system usually but if you want to work on multiple operating system parallelly say you want to work on the linux as well on top of your windows machine you can install oracle virtual box or you can install vmware tools these are the tools that helps you to configure your uh, virtual machines so this this concept is known as virtualizations where multiple machines you can be you can install on your machine so let me quickly give you the reference of the virtualization tool here right so if you look at this i have uh, this virtual machines installed on my machine so this is how it looks like i have oracle virtual box manager so i install this oracle virtual box and i have configured a lot of virtual machines on my desktop i have kubernetes machine jenkins docker and ansible right so i can spin up multiple virtual machines on my windows machines so these are all a linux based machines so that will help me to uh work simultaneously on multiple machines and uh, that is one of the um, implementation of your resource sharing so underneath we are having the same hardware a uh, single same cpu same memory same input output devices of my laptop these uh, virtual machines or guest machines they are using the sharing the resources from your windows host machine so i'm using windows 10 now 
On top of that, I have installed all these Linux machines. So I can work four or five virtual machines parallelly based upon the capacity of my uh, laptop, right? So that's how this virtualization concept is being used. So this is known as virtualization. If we go to the next level, that is known as containerization, right? So containerization is the advanced feature of virtualization. In virtualization, as you have seen in my screen in the Oracle virtual box, if I use 10 virtual machines, then I have to allocate some resources to that. I need to allocate them uh, some amount of CPU, some memory, say one CPU to each uh, virtual machine and certain amount of uh, bytes to or uh, to my each virtual machine, right? So each virtual machine consumes some capacity, some resources, and they are a little heavy, heavy weight, right? They need some time to boot up. But on the contrary, the containers are very lightweight. They are very fast, right? And they are very quick to launch and they are they consume very less memory. So that's why containers are very uh, useful as compared to the virtualization concepts, right? So that's all about Docker. So we can have a certain set of images already available on the Docker Hub or the Docker registry from where we can pull those images and run them as a form of container. And we can do our task and close it and then destroy it. For example, we can uh, also run the Jenkins application as a container, which is very quick and very uh, lightweight. We can do our work and destroy our container. That's how it's being used for your fast computation. So this is one of the very important feature. And this is being supported by almost all the cloud providers as well. Say so being it a Google Cloud or uh, HO or AWS, the Docker is being used across the technologies. Then we come to the next uh, one that is Puppet. So this is uh, from the family of the software configuration management tool. So as I told you, the software configuration management tool is used for the deployment as well as your configuring your infrastructure. So this is known as infrastructure as code. So you can configure your, for example, you started a new company and uh, in your company, you purchase 100, 100 computers, right? So you want to configure them with the same set of configurations. So you want to install Java on that, you want to install Python, you want to install Jenkins, right? So you want to configure all those machines with the same configuration. The one way is you install all these tools manually on these machines one by one, which is very time consuming, right? And the manual task. And this, uh, that's also an error, error prone as well. So to avoid all this, you can use Puppet or Chef or Ansible these are the infrastructure configuration tools, which can configure your all the 100 machines parallelly with the same set of configurations by writing the scripts. That's where these tools are being used. So Puppet is the oldest one from this family that comes around, uh, came around in around 2005. Then we have the Chef, that is the next one that came in around 2009. So Chef is the uh, a little advanced as compared to the puppet. Puppet is the oldest one. And one of comparatively is it is a little complex as compared to the chef and Ansible, right? So chef is uh, a little more refined version, you can say of puppet that came into the market in 2009. And it's been one of the most widely used in the last couple of years. But now the Ansible has started taking up the pace in the last one to three years. Ansible is being adopted by most of the companies. And this is the future of uh, software configuration management tool. And this is a tool which we'll be covering in our course, right? In our DevOps course, Ansible. So Ansible is, there are a lot of advantages of Ansible if we compare it with uh, Chef and Puppet. Ansible came into the market in 2013. And uh, in 2015, it's been taken over by the Red Hat. So it's now been handled by the Red Hat but it's also all three are open source. So there are certain advantages that you can see on the screen. It's freeware, it's powerful, flexible, agentless, efficient. So when we say agentless means there's only a server version of Ansible is required. You do not need to install the client part on any machine. But in case of Chef and Puppet, you need to install server as well as client on each and every machine. 
Same is the case for Puppet. You need to install server as well as the Puppet agents on all the node machines. So, and they are based upon the pull technology. And Sybil is based upon the push technology, where server is pushing the changes to all the host, rather than the node machines are looking for the server and asking for any changes, right? So push technology is better. How it is better? That we'll be covering in the advanced part, uh, the actual course. But just to understand, like it is based upon the push technology, where the server is pushing the changes to the nodes. So that's that's about all about Ansible. Next comes the Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is uh, you can say it's a containerization orchestration tool, right? So at the back end, we use Docker for Kubernetes, uh, and uh, it also supports other containerization tools as well. So this is basically used to orchestrate your containers. So containers cannot manage themselves, right? If you are running 10 containers and say some of the containers went into the hung state or uh, crashed, they cannot recover themselves. So Kubernetes is a kind of tool which helps to orchestrate or you can say help them to administrator is a kind of administrator for the containerization tools. So you can look at the diagram, it's having a Kubernetes master and then we have worker nodes, right? So master consists of multiple components, ATCD, API server, scheduler, manager. So we will not cover the details as of now, but just to give the overview that Kubernetes, how it looks like and what are the different components, right? So this is the very latest technology in uh, Docker, or sorry, in uh, DevOps, which was which came around three to four years old. It's not that old. Kubernetes is one of the latest technologies in Docker in the DevOps. So that is used for orchestrating your uh, Docker container, right? And uh, there's also an orchestration tool for Docker itself that is known as Docker Swarm, but that is not that popular. There are certain disadvantages of Docker Swarm. One is that it's only being, uh, can handle the Docker containers, not other kind of containers. But Kubernetes can handle any kind of containers, right? And also being used by all the cloud vendors as well, say cloud service providers. Kubernetes is being supported by Oracle uh, Cloud, or supported by Google Cloud, AWS Cloud, Amazon, or Azure Cloud. So in AWS, this is known as EKS, right? Enterprise Kubernetes Service. So in Azure, it is known as AKS, Azure Cloud, Azure Kubernetes, right? So it's being supported by all kinds of cloud platforms as well as your uh, local infrastructure as well. So we'll be covering this also as part of our course, Kubernetes, how to set up Kubernetes and how to deploy your applications, how to orchestrate your Docker containers. Then we will be covering uh, the next one is, uh, so these are the features of Kubernetes, which we'll not be covering now, right? So that will be uh, the details about Kubernetes, which we'll be checking, uh, doing it during the due course. Next one is the Negios. Negios is a monitoring tool. Monitoring the sense when you are working on an infrastructure or a project, right? So you should be knowing that how our infrastructure is behaving. What is the health of our servers? Are they running out of memory? Are they running out of the CPU? Or utilization is very high, right? So any kind of issues with your infrastructure, their configurations, this, they are being monitored through the monitoring tool. So Negus is one of the monitoring tool that helps you to monitor the health of your servers, how they are looking, whether they are uh, running out of uh, memory, right? So there is some threshold values we set up, say, if our CPU percentage goes more than 80%, just send a trigger, an alert, and send a mail to the administrator or someone uh, who's responsible to fix it. Or if our memory is being utilized more than 90%, just drop a mail with a critical error message that your memory is about to full. So these kind of alerts are being sent. Then you take the corrective measures to fix those issues with some buffer in between before it actually went to 100%, right? So these are known as threshold values. Maybe for 
about 70 percent it's a kind of warning message if we reach to the 80 percent it's a kind of error message 90 percent is a critical critical message right so that way we increase the level of uh, warnings and errors uh, and then we fix those issues before it went to the 100 percent so that's how these tools are very helpful to monitor the health of your infrastructure not only in uh, Nagios, but have we have a lot of other tools like Zebix, we have uh, Datadog, we have Splunk. So Splunk is also is a kind of it's an enterprise tool. It's uh, used. Uh, you need to purchase a license for that. Splunk is a very rich in features, but that's not open source. Nagios is an open source tool. Same with Zebix. Zebix is also an open source tool. So this is all about uh, <coughs> the Nagios. So these are the features of Nagios. It's, uh, uh, it works in the form of plugins. It has a lot of plugins. We need to install plugins to work for uh, various features for that, right? So this will also be covering as part of our uh, due course. So this is about uh, the architecture of the AWS. So AWS is a kind of cloud concept which is not will be covering the as part of the whole uh, in detail, but at the introductory, introductory level, because cloud computing is altogether a separate concept, but how DevOps works together with the clouds, right? So most of our sessions will be on our local infrastructure, how to set up our VMs or record virtual boxes. The advantage of setting up the local infrastructure is, one, you will understand from scratch how to set up your machines. Second is it's always retained with you for as many days or as many months or years. You can keep your data as long as you want to your local machines without paying anything because they are free, free or open source. In cloud works on the pay as you go model, right? So if you spin up the machines and instances, you work on server classes goes for one month, right? So if you spin up some instance, and you, you need to retain those instances for that many days. And if you keep your instances running in the background, you will be charged for that. So, and after one month or so, you have to bring down your instances and terminate them because otherwise you will be charged. So for one year, AWS provide you the free, of course, services. You can use it, but some limited uh, restriction, restricted access, right? And for not for all of the services. For example, Kubernetes services are chargeable. So if you work uh, on Kubernetes using AWS and Azure, you have to pay for it. It's not free of cost. But if you work Kubernetes on our local infrastructure, that's that you can do free of cost. So these there are certain advantages and disadvantages of using cloud. Right? So we'll be covering the very basic concepts of AWS and right? just touching what is cloud computing, what are the different type of cloud computing, what are the various components of AWS, how to spin up a new machine, on AWS, the new instance, right? And how to create account in AWS. So these things will be covering. And once we launch a new instance on AWS and we have that Linux instance running, then we'll come to the same level when we launch our virtual machines locally. So after that, you can perform everything in the same way as we are doing in our local machine. So that's about uh, AWS uh, concepts. Yeah, that's it from my side. Uh, maybe Pradeep, if you can go through further and uh, if you want to explain for the other components, then we'll come to the Q&A session. Yeah, we can uh, pretty much, you know, go forward with the slides, sir. Yeah. Yeah, slides are almost done, right? This is the last one. So just, just mention the duration of the course, right? So 36 hours of course is there. So we'll be having uh, 36 hours and each class is having a kind of practical sessions, except for the first session that will be theoretical because that will be more conceptual based. Apart from that, all the sessions are practical based. We'll be having lab sessions. As you could have uh, observed that for each session, we have different virtual machines. So we'll be having Kubernetes, Jenkins, Docker, and Sybil, right? So these are the topics we'll be covering. Right, and uh, we'll be doing hands-on after every session, and we'll be given some uh, uh, kind of uh, end of the session uh, more 
assignments to practice right and uh, then i think from the certification perspective you will be given six months of uh, uh, experience certificate for that and the lifetime access to your recording sessions right and there will be support available for any issues with that so that's about the features and there are some testimonials from the users who have gone through the training in the past and they have been uh, benefited for that being in their jobs or being in their on job trainings and they will be helpful to upskill themselves from their current technology to the latest one so that's about the testimonials and uh, with some good feedbacks yes so batch will be starting on 6th of february to 6th of march so it will be uh, around four four hour session per day is a weekend batches saturday sunday at morning 9:30 am ist to 1:30 pm ist right on saturday sunday and then uh, uh, we'll be covering this in the uh, approximately one month of course so that's about uh, the schedule right so that's with that we covered uh, everything from our side and if you have any questions or any doubts please feel free to reach out to us or you can ask me for any questions about any topic or any uh, particular of, of your uh, skill set of, of, of your whether you are forfeited for this course or any kind of doubts if you have you can ask.